Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, for those of you in person and to those watching us live streaming, I will ask our board secretary to take role and establish a quorum for the record. Thank you. President Craighead? Here. Member Benitez? Here. Member Lopez? Present. Member Otto? Here. And student member Aguilar? Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to ask our student representative from Lakewood High School to lead us in the pledge. Hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have forms pr provided here by our board secretary. Um, if you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form now indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda. The board took action on item 3.1, confidential student matters pursuant to California Education Code 35146. The board voted 4-0 with Mr. Miller absent to expel two students. ID numbers 2822 and 0342 in compliance with Education Code sections 48900 and 48915. Both students were recommended to be considered for a suspended expulsion with an opportunity to attend another school within the district. The students will not be eligible to apply for readmission until after June 15, 2024. The board also voted to readmit student ID number 2747. The vote by the board was 3-0, with Mr. Miller absent and Ms. Lopez abstaining. Um, we will now have the adoption of the agenda. I need a motion. So moved. Um, I need a second. Second. And is there any discussion? <laughs> no. Okay, because I think we needed to move. Oh, my bad. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. And Doug was giving me the cue. Yeah. Um, I I'd like to um, uh, move from pull the from the consent calendar item fourteen point nine um, as a separate uh, item to, for us to take action uh, on. Yes. So what I will do is I'll move item 14.9 from the consent calendar. We will take a separate vote on that, and that's because it was numbered improperly in the rest of the uh, packet. Well, the supporting, the supporting documentation had a different number, but um, yes. I, um, I'm going to abstain from that, and I want to be able to vote for the other items okay. uh, in the consent calendar. Okay, so we will make a note of that and we'll adopt the agenda with that amendment. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the cue, Doug, I just missed it. <laughs> okay, so uh, <clears throat> we don't need a roll call vote on this one, do we? You don't, but uh, technically, Maybe. since you made the amendment, you need a new motion and a new second based on the amendment. Move to approve the agenda with the proposed amendment. New second. And we'll take a, a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And our student representative, our student board member, I should say. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Thank you. So that passes the agenda. Adoption 
with the amendment passes 4-0 with a preferential vote from our student board member. Um, and now we are at the point in the agenda where we will officially recognize our student representative from Lakewood High School, Raymond Greer III, but I understand you go by Trey. Yes. Great, it's your turn and we're anxious to hear from you. Good evening. <coughs> I would first like to say thank you for having me here to speak on behalf of Lakewood High School. My name is Raymond Greer III, but I go by Trey, and I am proud to say that I'm a, the student body president of the Lakewood Lancers. Alongside with ASB, I'm also a part of the track and field team where I also play the role as one of the leaders. I am also a member of the Black Student Union to embrace black culture around campus. On campus, we have accomplished many goals so far, especially our homecoming week. Because of the success that we had last year with the homecoming dance being our first, we decided to bring it back this year. In fact, we actually exceeded the amount of tickets that we intended to sell. But now I would like to highlight some more, more recent events that has been happening around campus, focusing more of our school spirit, athletics, and academics. This Saturday, we're, we will be hosting our winter formal dance. The theme is Frozen in Time to go with the winter season with the senior theme colors of light blue, dark blue, and white. We hope to have a good turnout, but also have fun and a safe time. Our school spirit is also being spread to current eighth graders through an annual event that we host on campus called Sight Night. Last week on campus, it was filled with middle schoolers who, who hopefully will become Lakewood Lancers in the future. There was a good turnout and many students visited our athletic department. Furthermore, I'd like to highlight our uh, athletics on school campus. More importantly, the boys basketball team, they're doing an outstanding job right now. Last Friday, we had a 76 to 58 victory over Jordan and this week we'll be taking on Polly. This is a really big game for us because if we win, we'll have the first place title for Morley. And most importantly, our academic plans for Lakewood. We're coming up on the end of first semester, which is a big deal because our final exams are coming up. Students all around campus could be seen preparing for their final exams because we all want to pass and get the desired grades that we all intended to have. And for seniors such as myself, we'll be anxiously, anxiously waiting for our college acceptance letters to come in. Once again, thank you for having me here tonight. And you guys have a good one. But, but Trey, don't, don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. We usually have um, questions. Now, did you mention that you're a senior? Yes. You, you did. So we always like to ask about your plans for next year. Next year, I plan on going to Cal State Long Beach, and I want to major in healthcare administration. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, congratulations on that. We wish you all the best. Would you like to acknowledge anybody here um, that's here to support you? Uh, my family was not able to make it here tonight, but Mr. Booth, the Athletics uh, Activities Director, is here. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Booth, for being here. Okay. Well, we have um, um, a video to watch, but after – oh, photo. Everybody's given me the – <laughs> and, yeah, and but Dr. Camarino has a uh, question or comment or something. Yeah, tr something. Trey is very humble. I just want to share that one of the things that makes him an outstanding leader on the campus is that not only is he involved and participates in all the activities at Lakewood as a ASB member, but as an athlete and a mentor. He takes students aside and talks to them when there's time of adversity. But also, more importantly, he's gone back to Hoover, our alma mater, to coach the track team, the girls' track team. So he's one of the track coaches at Hoover.
Okay, thank you for all the reminders. Um, as I was ready to move on to the next item on the agenda, I get a lot of, of this. I'm like, right, 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 pictures. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, next on the agenda, we have um, a vision and action. And um, we're gonna take a look at the research office and I'm very happy that we're gonna be taking a look at the research office because they are unsung heroes. We rely so much on our data. We are always asking for more. We're asking for, um, I don't know, beyond uh, what is provided, which is quite a lot. So it's gonna be nice. I'm looking forward to seeing this um, video. So here, here we are. So part of our role as the research department is really to collaborate across our district with the different departments and really look at our uh, programs that we have throughout our district and ensuring that what we currently have either at site or the um, programs that are within departments are serving our students well. Um, we look at the data, not only just quantitative data, but we also look at uh, qualitative data through some of our um, surveys as well as feedback that we get from um, some of the sessions that we provide professional development to our site leaders. And it really informs how we can better support our students in the way that we provide tools to help monitor and continuing those programs. So of course beyond the academics, uh, we know now more than ever that uh, academic outcomes, student performance, is truly a byproduct of social and emotional learning. When you are nurturing a student's sense of identity or sense of belonging, you know that you are impacting their ability as students to perform better in the classrooms and outside of the classrooms. You know, we think that when we look at numbers, it's about we need to put on our data scientist hat, but it's more important that that we collaborate with educators, administrators, because they're the ones that are making inferences about the data. So we need to make sure that they're looking at it through a lens of equity and social justice to make sure that our students do feel seen and heard. And something I picked up from um, Veronica Madrigal was that the data tells a story, and I like that part of it. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, public testimony. Let's see, so now it's time for public comment. Um, I see we have one person who's here to speak on um, an item listed on the agenda. So um, I'll, just, I'll just remind you, you have three minutes and first we have uh, Viola May Bledsoe. Good evening, board. Um, I'm here to talk about the appointment of the Personnel Commission. CSCA interviewed Terry for the um, Personnel Commission. He is currently the Personnel Commission. We have supported him and he has done tremendous work for classified employees. We are kind of disappointed that the district has decided to go with another uh, person to uh, recommend, but CSEA and myself personally still back Terry Uliseski as our personnel commission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, several people who would like to speak on items not listed on the agenda. Uh, comments on an item not listed for discussion today must be about issues that are within the jurisdiction of the board. Please note that due to California law, the board cannot enter into discussion on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members or staff may ask clarifying questions or provide clarification regarding public comments but such discussion is limited. Again, I'll just remind everybody that there's a, a three minute, um, yeah, three minute limit. And first we have Carol Jones. Good evening, my name is Carol Jones and I'm a parent of triplets who are freshmen at Wilson High School. 
I'm here to raise my concern that LBUSD seems to have veered away from its inclusive policy of all means all. The, what I'm speaking about is the LBUSD um, Instagram social media post after the unprovoked Hamas terrorist attack on Israel of October 7th was a bland, and I'm quoting now, our hearts are with the children and families impacted by the current events taking place in the Middle East, close quote. There was no condemnation of terror. There was no acknowledgement of the unprovoked nature of the attack on Israeli citizens. There was no mention of the horrific beheadings, dismemberings of females, butchering, rapes, and killings. The LBUSD post seemed to be a vain attempt to be neutral on what LBUSD mistakenly was viewing as a political matter. There, were no, there are no two sides when it comes to fighting terror. Terror is terror. It's horrific, inexcusable, and needs to be condemned as such. That's the message that should have been sent to our students and families. Since October 7th, activists who identify as pro-Palestinian have created a windstorm of anti-Israel messaging locally, threatening the perception of well-being and safety among the Jewish community. Recent hate-related vandalism has also occurred against members of our local Jewish community. It's imperative that LBUSD monitor not only the direct messages it sends to its student body, but also that LBUSD monitor any actions taken by vendors LBUSD engages that would encourage anti-Semitic actions locally. Californians for Justice, who has a contract with LBUSD valued at nearly $1 million, has recently advertised and promoted a boycott of Israeli businesses. Bettina Love, an upcoming speaker at Jordan High School, has pro-Palestinian posts on her social media, grandstanding an anti-Israel position. LBUSD must recognize that by engaging speakers and vendors who have divisive views and then by promoting these companies and individuals as leaders of our young and impressionable students, that this both isolates and excludes the Jewish community. Because of these two examples I just cited, I now feel a greater need to vet the educational opportunities presented by LBUSD before allowing my children to participate. I hope the LBUSD board will recognize that the extent of its influence extends beyond its direct messaging and includes the voices of the vendors and speakers it engages. I ask that the board consider corrective action against these or other vendors or speakers conveying divisive and one-sided messages to our students, and further that the board modify the criteria it uses to engage speakers and vendors in the future to avoid engaging companies or individuals that espouse terror in any form or who promulgate anti-Israel views within their own platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Anna. Good evening to the board and the executive team. My name is Anna Selusky. I am a mother. I have two daughters here in Long Beach Unified School District. One is at Rogers, and she's a sixth grader. And one is at Wilson, and she is a freshman. I am also a member of the uh, executive board of Jewish Long Beach, a member of Temple Israel, and I also sit on the symphony board and the symphony foundation here in Long Beach. And I'm very involved and active in my community. Uh, I'm here tonight because I am concerned as a mother about the contract with California for Justice uh, that has pushed into all of our schools, particularly the high schools, uh, within the district and, and I understand uh, has an $860,000 contract with the district. I don't know what kind of vetting was done before hiring them. I understand it's a contract that is on a rolling basis and it renews annually and I'm asking you tonight not to renew that contract and to cancel it immediately. And the reason I feel this way is because I have looked at their social media posts and they're not only anti-Semitic but they're outright offensive. After two weeks after October 7th, after 1,200 people were brutally murdered in Israel, this organization was calling for the end of the apartheid regime. That is not what happened. Israel is not an apartheid state, and that's not part of the Long Beach Unified School District curriculum regarding that, that part of the world. They called for ending the genocide that is occurring in that region of the world, completely misconstruing the fact that Hamas, a, a well-funded billion-dollar terrorist organization, invaded a sovereign state and, and raped and murdered women and children and adults. 
and took 260 of them hostage. That is not the type of organization that I want influencing my daughters or anyone else in Long Beach Unified who's attending school here. It's a Title VI violation. It's a violation, there's a state statute that it violates. And I forget the name of it, but there's a state anti-boycott statute that it violates. And this organization needs to be removed. It has no place in Long Beach Unified. It doesn't hold up our value system of inclusivity and diversity. In fact, uh, Dr. Love, the speaker that you hope to, that you plan on engaging and speaking this weekend, if anyone's read her book, it talks about the abolition of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I don't know if anyone here has read her book, but that is what she's demanding. And she, in her book, talks about having a black versus a white world, and there's nothing in between. And it's about the oppressor versus the oppressed. Those are not values that I want my children taught. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Next, we have Pamela. Good evening. My name is Pamela Rima, and I'm a parent of children at three different Long Beach schools. I have a junior at Wilson, I have a junior at Milliken, and I have a soft, uh, seventh grader at Stanford. I'm here because I want to ensure that what you, as our school board, when you select a curriculum, when you evaluate teachers, when you partner with organizations and speakers to round out the learning opportunities and development of policies for our children, that as much care and scrutiny is given to the implementation of the content and messages being shared through training as you do in their selection. This has become particularly worrisome in the light of the Israel-Hamas war. It is more important than ever that our students' learning opportunities, both in and out of the classroom, are not filled with propaganda, hate, and false narratives. We know that this is in fact happening on our school campuses, in classrooms, student groups, and on social media feeds. Our Jewish students, whether they are white, persons of color, they have disabilities, or are part of the LGBTQ community, they're experiencing this hate firsthand. They're scared, and we as the parents, when we talk to each other about this stuff, the one thing that is consistent is that our students say, please, do not talk to my teacher about this. Don't go to the school. We're already scared. We already feel othered. Please don't do this to us. So if you're not hearing anything, it's because our kids do not want to be pointed out as the student that brings it up, because they already feel that way. They don't want to rock the boat, and they don't want to bring more attention and more hate on themselves. They're seeing it all over social media. What happens when you walk around wearing a Star of David? We saw it at the city council meeting, the mocking of someone who was scared to wear a Star of David. Is this how you want your students in your district to feel? Is this what we want our students to be learning? And is anti-Semitism ever OK? And if you're wondering, the answer to all those questions is no. Long Beach is an amazing community with many teachers, community leaders, and student groups doing the work to educate and elevate our young people. I'm asking that you take action to ensure that none of this work that is being done is at the cost of harming our students. And I'm not just talking about our Jewish or Israeli students here. I'm talking about all students. They do not need to be fed propaganda, they need to learn. My seventh grader, his history class, they're studying Islam right now and they're enjoying it. It's a fantastic job. It can be done. It doesn't need to include hate and propaganda. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next we have Chase. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chase Archangel. I am an autistic youth advocate in the fourth grade Excel program at Garfield Elementary. Our school mascot is Tigers, and it stands for T, take responsibility for your actions, I, inspire kindness, G, go for your goals each day, E, excel in learning, R, respect everyone, and S, stop and think before you act. Those are great things, but they're hard to do when we're not feeling safe. 
About a month ago, another fourth grade student said to me, you're gonna die today. Then he started pulling something out of, out of his backpack. That's when I ran for my life and went inside the building. I told the teachers, and that's when we found out that, out that he had a toy gun. He also said, I know what a real gun looks like. This has been very traumatizing and very scary, and I haven't felt supported by some of, some of the school staff. I would like to see change in how LBUSD supports students dealing with threats and bullying, especially students with disabilities, like me. I love learning and being a student at LBUSD. We need everyone to help make it a safer place to be physically and emotionally. I want all LBUSD students to feel that their voice matters and that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chase. Joanna? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joanna Archangel, here to support my son, Chase. That's a hard act to follow. Um, although this has been very heavy for my family, I hope to highlight the importance of effective listening and collaborating with important stakeholders. The incident he described occurred after school at the Child Development Center's CDC program at Garfield. While they knew about it, I was not informed by the teachers. I had to learn from him as I drove him from school to home. This was December 14th, the 11th anniversary of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. The Sandy Hook Promise link is on the LBUSD website front page, thank you for that, for promoting safety through See Something, Say Something, anonymous reporting. This incident wasn't reported to the school admin until Friday the following day. School safety was also not called until the following week on Tuesday after I advocated for action steps considering what was said and done, what you just heard Chase say. Again, um, a threat assessment was not made until about a whole week after the incident. The following is from the California School Boards Association. With the passage of Senate Bill 906, California's local educational agencies are required to notify families annually about safe gun storage beginning in the 2023 to 24 school year. I request that the board review SB 906, especially the parts about obligations and threats and reporting threats and perceived threats while keeping elementary schools and childcare programs within LBUSD in mind to help keep all students, staff and community safe. I ask that LBUSD create a more comprehensive plan reviewed by a multidisciplinary team to address and prevent school violence and threats. I ask that the improvement of the following be considered. Support for students, all parties. For example, the school counselor also checking in with the recipient of threats or bullying. Communication with parents and guardians and between after school programs and school day staff. Thorough, accurate, and timely reporting to appropriate persons such as school safety when needed. Weaving in equity and trauma-informed practices and approaches, including consideration for students with disabilities and families who may not speak English fluently. And last but not least, adequate school safety training for LBUSD staff. I'd like to thank CDC program coordinator, Lindsay Evans and director Sarah Forrester, who listened with empathy to my concerns. They were able to acknowledge and begin to address gaps in collaboration with me, my son and teachers at CDC without being defensive. I ask the board for continuous support of physical and felt safety for all at LBUSD. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Lena. Hi. Um, I first wanna say it was a pleasure to witness um, Trey, a model student at LBUSD, um, lead us in the pledge. I'm glad I got to be here for that. Um, I'm Lena Schuper, Long Beach resident, single mom of a middle schooler and high schooler. I'm an educator, CSULB alum, and my first teaching position was here at Cabrillo High School 20 years ago. When I taught in Bellflower Unified and Anaheim Union High School districts, the English and History departments taught middle and high school vetted Holocaust curriculum that meets the legal requirement which passed in California in 1985. We are a Jewish family, so this is important to us especially. And belong, we belong currently and have always been part of Temple Israel here in Long Beach and the JCC also. 
When my family was moving back to Long Beach, a city I've always loved and thought of as an inclusive city, I attended the Long Beach High School Fair to help my son find a good fit school for him. Multiple principals said that they were not aware of any Holocaust curriculum, and one principal said that they did teach World War II, but since they were an engineering track school, they emphasized the inventions of the war and not the Holocaust or the horrific consequences of propaganda. Research shows, please look this up for yourself, research shows incredible benefits to the adults who learn Holocaust curriculum, as well as to all minority communities, which supports the law to stay in place. I'm asking the district to closely examine the organizations and the speakers that you bring to, into the schools as, um, as is come to light, oh, as has come to light, that the, it has come to light to me that the LBUSD is partnering with anti-Jewish, anti-Israel folks. I would like you to comb through your history and ethnic studies curriculum to ensure it's not sending inaccurate messages to students I have seen um, images of maps of Israel in your curriculum that shows Israel dominating Palestines over their land. And this is just inaccurate. It's in our history books here in LBUSD. Um, and I would like you to make sure that you're bringing back the Holocaust curriculum into your schools. There is an amazing program at um, USC has um, the Shoah Foundation where they have collected over 52,000 interviews of um, survivors of genocide, including the one on October 7th. Um, no matter what the school focus has, whatever track it is, we want you to emphasize the very real consequences of propaganda and hatred towards a people. And since the law of Holocaust curriculum was put into place, there are outcome studies that show these benefits. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. And um, our final speaker will be Tonya Reyes Uranga. Good evening. My name's Tonya, and I'm here in support of community schools. I'm sure everyone agrees that in concept, all schools should be community schools. But by definition, it's a school that looks to address the many barriers to learning and to provide family support and the needs of the students by nurturing a learning environment. In community schools, nonprofits, community groups, health and welfare agencies, and parents work hand in hand to provide the best learning environment possible. The key word is community. The community needs to be organized, educated, and involved throughout the entire process. I understand teachers also support community schools, but to be successful, it should be parent and community driven. I recently received several flyers at the end of last year asking us to call our trustees to support community schools. However, the only two trustees they mentioned via large photos were from District 2 and 4, coincidentally, the only ones up for re-election. This is not, this not very subtle political piece was paid for by TALB and featured both their endorsed candidates. This flyer, whether intentional or not, uh, actually reduced the attention and importance of community schools by becoming a shameless political mail piece. This bad faith effort by TALB to support and inform the public I'm not sure if it went to the entire city or just the second and the fourth district, but to inform the public about community schools failed miserably and the piece ended up and tossed in the trash by most who received it. The mailer asked us to contact school board members and so I did. Unfortunately, I have not received a response from my representative in District 2 to no surprise to me and many others. Um, since I haven't heard a response to any of my communications in the last three years. Uh, I will say that I do want to thank the only trustee who acknowledged my support uh, letter and thank her for the attention to the issue. I hope to see more open and vocal support from all our trustees and more parent and community organizing efforts for community uh, schools. On a side note, well, on second thought, I think I'll save this. It's all and basically all District uh, 2 issues, and so I'd like to do it when my member is present. But since I have just a quick minute, I too um, want to say publicly thank you to uh, Terry Ujaleski. He's uh, really loved being on the Personnel Commission, and I'm sorry to see, if not for a few points, him not going back. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have reports on superintendent advisory groups. We will start with the Business Budget and Policy Development Group, Dr. Benitez. 
Thank you, President Craighead. So um, at our February 7th upcoming school board meeting, our board will receive three uh, policies up for revision and one new policy. So uh, we had a chance to discuss uh, these at our advisory group meeting today. First policy up for revision is board policy 4030. <clears throat> in, uh, regarding non-discrimination and employment. So this will provide some clarifying language, uh, updated, uh, revised clarifying language around employee, uh, employer and employee, employee uh, interaction. Uh, the second policy up for consideration, um, revised the policy up for con uh, consideration for our board is board policy 5145. <coughs> around non-discrimination and harassment. So this updates our policy uh, in alignment with state and federal policy. Third policy up for revision is board policy 5145.13. Um, and this uh, is in regards to our inter interaction, our district's interaction with federal immigration uh, entities uh, to ensure that all of our families uh, feel safe. Uh, students and families feel safe at school. Um, we did have some substantive questions, uh, President Craighead and I, regarding this policy. Um, so this is going to come back to us with some revised um, language and additional language uh, regarding our in interactions, our district's interactions with immigration um, officials. And then finally, a new policy up for consideration is around attendance and the importance and the important correlation between attendance and student success um, and insurance, insurances that we do as much as we can as a district to ensure that our students um, go to school um, and that we support students and families uh, around attendance. So uh, that policy also um, is going through some revisions and that's a new policy uh, for us. So that's board policy 5113.1. So looking forward to our board discussions regarding those four policies. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Um, next, we'll have a report from Instruction and Student Learning, Ms. Lopez. Yes, the uh, Purchasing and Contracts Reports includes um, four additional contracts for guest uh, conductors and musicians um, in support of the All District Band and Orchestra Concert which will be held on January 30, 30th at 7 p.m. at Jordan High School. Um, we'll we also discuss the anti-vaping lessons, um, which are part of the curriculum for seventh grade students um, in their health classes. And in the elementary grades, the adoption uh, curriculum was published before the introduction, the use of vaping, and does not uh, include vaping. Uh, however, LBUSD has provided supplemental resources to elementary school teachers, and um, this program is called You and Me, Together Vape Free. This is in alignment with the fourth grade California health standards on alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Uh, LBUSD is also looking to add content-related anti-vaping measures um, to wellness lessons that counselors uh, will provide to elementary and middle school students. And then finally, we discuss the policy on weapons, weapons and dangerous uh, instruments, which now allows employees to contact law enforcement if they are alerted to or observe a student in possession uh, of a weapon, imitation firearm, or a dangerous instrument. Uh, this is, of course, unless a student has obtained written permission prior um, and there's only really three circumstances, which include that they're an ROTC, and these would be Lakewood High School, um, Lakewood High School Poly and Cabrillo offer ROTC. Um, if these, um, uh, or if they're using prompts for uh, theater, um, or in a pathway uh, like the criminal justice pathway in McBride, Cabrillo, or Jordan. And so um, I think that we heard earlier from uh, a student who experienced something from uh, the, that uh, a student brought in a weapon or imitation of, and so now it will allow employees to contact law enforcement directly. And so, and I think that these amendments to the policy will help, help our schools uh, be safer. 
And that's all. Thank you. Um, we don't have a report for workforce development. Our Mr. Miller is absent, so we will go to student outcome focused government governance with Mr. Otto. So and I'm going to ask that we defer this discussion to 17.1, which is the adoption of board monitoring calendar, which we've been working on, and uh, we'll bring that up tonight. Okay, we can do that. Um, next on the agenda is the consent calendar. This consent calendar groups the approval of routine agenda items into one action for efficiency and to allow the board to focus our meetings more on student outcomes and other key issues uh, for the district. So we need a motion. So moved. Uh, second, with just clarification that we did pull item 14.9 from the consent calendar. Yes. So what we are voting on is 14.1 through 14.8. Uh, Ms. Lopez? I do have a few questions, and I know um, I did not give these questions on Monday, but um, on item 14.4, the new reclassification criteria for EL state that um, this new criteria is for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities and my question is, what criteria will be used to determine which, which EL students have the most significant cognitive disabilities? And that's my first question. I can elaborate on that criteria. <coughs> this is a request for approval of a third pathway, if you will, for reclassification of students. Uh, this comes out of recommendations from our CAC uh, of looking at opportunities for our students with disabilities to reclassify through at least alternative pathways. Currently, there are two approved pathways for reclassification. There's a traditional pathway that looks at four pieces of criteria based on the LPAC, the traditional uh, assessment of English learners that the state has approved. And then other district assessment measures in Long Beach Unified, we look at our iReady and our uh, SBAC results as additional district measures. And then of course, teacher evaluation and parent recommendation. The second pathway is an alternative pathway and it is specifically designed for students with disabilities. It looks at students that take the alternative LPAC and then other district assessments, which in this case would be the unique learning system assessment that we use within the district as well as um, elementary achievement reports um, as an additional criteria that could be um, examined. And then a teacher evaluation and parent recommendation. This third pathway really creates an opportunity for reclassification for our students uh, with severe cognitive disabilities. Uh, this would be students that are eligible for the alternative LPAC. So that is part of the criteria by which they would be identified. These students typically will have either attempted to take or um, were unsuccessful in taking the alternative LPAC. The additional assessments that we use within the district, the unique learning system um, assessments would be part of that criteria then, and it would become part of an IEP discussion for potential reclassification of students. There is one caveat to this pathway. It does look at students that have been in our system at least six years prior to consideration of this alternative pathway to reclassification. These students would obviously be eligible under the currently approved alternative pathway. Uh, this third pathway would be specifically for students fifth grade and above who have been in our system at least six years for consideration by their IEP team for reclassification. Thank you. Um, on item 14.7, we're spending 74,200 on professional development for the impl implementation uh, or continuation of the dual enrollment program when our data shows that few students, um, and in particular, few students of color are benefiting from it. And I believe that dual em uh, enrollment uh, is important, helps our students, but I want to know what language we may have in place that helps us to ensure that students across the district including schools that have underutilized this program, like Jordan or Cabrillo, are better able to access it. Um. Yeah, I can address that question as well. Um, 
We are at the early onset of dual enrollment options within the district. So traditionally, you can look at dual enrollment as really being student and parent generated of looking at how students have really looked outside of our system to take advantage of dual enrollment options. Uh, what we are in the process of doing as we move forward is looking at more district embedded dual enrollment options. One example of that might be what we have at Browning High School with our early college program, which is a program that allows students to basically earn um, an associate's degree in high school through their coursework at Browning. So these are courses that are embedded into the um, course schedule of students as receiving both high school and college credit within the program. The more we can embed programs like that into our system, we guarantee greater equity and access to dual enrollment options within the system. So that is one pathway that we are pursuing at Browning specifically. Outside of Browning, we're looking at pathway embedded courses as an alternative to existing coursework. So what this would look at would be um, a particular pathway and the industry courses within that pathway and what courses perhaps that we do not offer within our current course of study at the high school level, but that could be enriched through a dual enrollment option. So you might look at this as um, a global logistics uh, pathway at Cabrillo um, and what courses Long Beach City College might have that might augment or support that global logistics pathway and enrich the curriculum through a dual enrollment option, giving students both high school and college credit through that pathway option. We are just in the process and working with our secondary school's office of identifying which pathways and which courses might be viable considerations for that expansion of that pathway embedded course. Um, and then of course, there's still that option for students to pursue uh, dual enrollment courses on their own outside of the current schedule, which many of our students do take advantage of, which would be um, after school, during the summer, or on the weekends. Thank you, and I do have one last question. Uh, a contract with TRP Education for 230,000 for online math tutoring services, um, it's for selected middle school students. The question is how will students be selected and if they're not selected and it's open to everyone, why do we have selected? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. I'm here. Uh, it is open to all students within our middle school math programs. So currently the high school um, program that's available through this same agency, TPR, which through, is through Princeton Review, and the program that is accessible to students is the tutor.com, which provides real-time online tutoring to students upon, upon request. It could be students during the school day, or it could be after school for homework support, or any time that a student needs uh, tutoring support. This is a program that was approved by the board in September, uh, was initiated in October, and has currently held over a thousand sessions with our high school students. At the high school level, it is to selected students that are in our algebra, geometry, and algebra two courses. The middle school contract is specifically for students participating in any of our middle school math courses, math six, math six accelerated, math seven, math seven accelerated, math eight, or algebra. So by selected, it really means students that are enrolled in those uh, specific math courses, which within our system is essentially all of our students. So you have to be enrolled in one of those courses, but all of our students are technically enrolled in one of those math courses. So it really is accessible and available to every middle school math student. Okay, so just for clarification, it's not for selected middle school students, it's really for everyone. That's correct. Thank you. Any um, further discussion? Yes. President Crackhead, I wanted to follow up on uh, item 14.4 around the reclassification of our English learners with um, disabilities. Um, Dr. Lund, I don't wanna lose sight of the importance of this item. Um, not only have we heard from our CAC uh, community, uh, parents, caregivers, uh, and families, uh, but we've also heard from DLAC uh, around the uh, reclassification, the challenges and, and, and concerns around reclassification. So, 
uh, for our multilingual learner families, for our families with students with disabilities. Could you walk us through an example of with this option three that we have, this alternative um, option three, what would that look like for a fifth grader uh, and beyond uh, in terms of this third uh, option here with this consideration? So you would look first at prior year assessment results. So you would take this fifth grader or sixth grader and their prior year's results on the LPAC. And in this case, these would be students that had taken actually the alternative LPAC. So they've been pre-identified by their IEP team as having been an appropriate assessment for them based on the program that they're in. So they would look at that alternative LPAC result and look at the data, the results from that assessment. You would look at the ULS assessment data as well. If the student was in fifth grade, you would also look at their uh, achievement report scores and specifically in the domains of literacy. So you'd look, be looking at the reading and writing, listening and speaking scores on their achievement report. Under a traditional pathway, under that alternative pathway, you would look at did they meet the threshold for a reclassification that the district has set based on the alternative LPAC assessment, the ULS assessment, or the achievement report scores. And they, our research department actually pulls that data and determines which students have met that criteria. That's an existing pathway as it stands now. We send out then letters to teachers of students that have been pre-identified based on those results of who is eligible for reclassification. What this new pathway would allow is students that did not get identified in that alternative pathway approach to be identified by their IEP team, looking back at that similar data and saying, how did the students do on this alternative LPAC? How did students do on the ULS assessment? looking across all the other IEP data that they have at their disposal. And in this case, because it is for our most cognitively uh, disabled students, looking at the language ability that matches the cognitive ability and having that discussion as an IEP team to determine if this student would be eligible through this alternative third pathway to reclassification. Which in those cases, Dr. Lunn, again, I don't wanna lose the important implication here, would provide reclassification, an opportunity for reclassification for students that might not otherwise have been identified. That's correct. Purely based on the individual, the IEP, uh, right? That's correct. Okay, so, so I think this is a huge uh, uh, win for uh, not just our multilingual learners, our students with disabilities, but for our district, uh, uh, you know, wide in terms of students, uh, in terms of addressing really equity gaps. Uh, that we have, one, by the traditional assessments themselves, uh, but two, uh, in terms of providing alternative opportunities for students that would otherwise not have an opportunity to reclassify. And, and I think that's a huge, again, uh, testament to the efforts of DLACs, ELACs, uh, our CAC uh, members uh, as us moving forward on recommendations. Uh, that have come out of those conversations with uh, parents. All I have more to say about our conversations with CAC last week, but um, I wanted to make sure that we lifted that up. Thank you for asking the questions, Board Member uh, Lopez, because it is in the consent calendar. Unless you're looking at the specific items, um, you know we we would, wouldn't necessarily be able to have this discussion. Though, so yeah, you and for if that. I may, along those lines, uh, we are one of the few districts that is offering this as an alternative pathway to reclassification. This is not a common approach that all districts have adopted, so it really does put us in a, a unique category to really allow the IEP teams to address really uh, students that historically would never have reclassified yeah. um, based on the current criteria. Yeah. Great work. And it is a collaboration, obviously, with our Office of School Support yeah. Services, our research office, to identify this criteria. So thank you to the collaboration and the leadership of Angie Gonzalez is in my office that headed up that approach. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when I was looking at the uh, classified personnel report, <coughs> I noticed that we had <coughs> a retirement um, <clears throat> of somebody who is... Uh, with us tonight, she's usually with us. She attends uh, many board meetings. And so I have 
a few little things to share with everybody. So of course I'm talking about Viola Mae Bledsoe, who is currently an instructional aide at Cabrillo. She is retiring at the end of this month after 31 years of service. Um, thank you so much. And um, Viola Mae started working in September of 1992. She started her career at Stanford and worked at Jordan, Buffum, and Tucker, just to name a few sites. Um, Viola May is a highly professional, experienced, and very qualified instructional assistant in the art classroom. She gets to know the students, their IEPs and particular needs, accommodations and modifications, and helps personalize um, and support their instruction and classroom experience. She is a very caring person and supports the social and emotional growth of students as well. She's a dependable colleague, an excellent communicator, and a pleasure to be able to teach with every day. That's um, obviously from her, her colleagues and people who know. So, um, Viol, I just want to thank you for all of your service. I know that you not only stand up for the students that you work with, but you also stand up for your peers. You're always here speaking out for your um, CSEA family, and we appreciate you and wish you all the best. So can we have a round of applause for... <laughs> and a standing ovation. Wow. Well, that, that sounds like a very well-rounded scope of work, even including High Hill. Um, but we do appreciate everything you've done, and we've all seen, you know, your strength and, and how you share of yourself. So thank you, and, and good luck. So we actually need to take the vote, so I will hand it over to our board secretary for a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 4-0. Thank you. And next on the agenda, we have item 14.9, and this is the adoption of resolution 011724-A authorizing Chief Business and Financial Officer to compensate board member Benitez for his absence at a board meeting. Um, we need a motion. Move approval. And I need a second. Second. Um, any discussion? Did, okay. Um, then we'll do a roll call vote on that one as well. Thank you. Um, member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Uh, member Benitez? Uh, I abstain. You abstain? Okay. And then student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 3-0 with one abstention. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have item 15.1, approval of finance report B. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Um, we'll have our board secretary take a roll call vote. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. That passes 4-0. Thank you. And item number 16, um, superintendent items, Dr. Baker. Item 16.1 is to, is for information only to accept the second quarterly report that is received by the governing board so that we can send it to the county superintendent of schools. Thank you. Um, and that's information only, so 
that doesn't require us to take action. But I'd like to note that both items were resolved. Uh, yes. President Craighead. Yes, both items were resolved. Thank you for that question. And just a quick question: um, Could we elab can someone elaborate on the two complaints that were filed um, and resolved that appeared on the Williams lawsuit settlement uh, quarterly report? I don't, we don't have someone that's here to speak to them right now. They involved uh, remediation of restroom supplies and a plumbing fixture that was resolved. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next, we have new business item 17.1, and this will be an action item, but first I will turn it over to Mr. Moskovitz so we can talk about the board monitoring calendar. Thank you, President Craighead, and I can get the slides pulled up. Awesome. Well, you all all um, fondly recall all of our robust conversation uh, last year and through the fall that culminated in your adoption of your board goals and guardrails. And from that, you'll, you'll also likely recall uh, A.J. Cravehill, who was here as our consultant, talked about now that the um, goals and guardrails were developed, that one of the next steps was to create the uh, progress monitoring calendar. And um, he even made reference to creating a five-year calendar at this point. So from there, uh, we had an opportunity, myself, Dr. Madrigal, and others had an opportunity to meet with our Student Outcomes Focused Governance Advisory Group. That included Dr. Benitez and Mr. Otto, and a, a deep appreciation to the two of them, really giving some great input and feedback on where we were at. Um, ultimately getting to us to this point tonight, where we're able to bring forward to you um, what we believe is a, a good progress monitoring calendar that will get us through a full year, and it'll give you all an opportunity to give us some feedback along the way if this is the right um, cadence of, of data, the right timing, the right kinds of data. And from that, then we would be prepared to extend that, if you will, for the next five years. So um, we're gonna present to you tonight a one-year calendar for progress monitoring aligned to your board goals and guardrails. And then uh, we'll learn from you and we'll learn from one another as we go through this year to be able to develop what would become that five-year calendar. So just a deep appreciation to Dr. Madrigal and her team. They put a lot of time behind the scenes. And so I'm very excited to hand it off to her and she'll be able to share not just the calendar, but some of the data and kinds of data that would uh, show up throughout this year. Dr. Madrigal. Thank you. Um, good evening, Board President Craighead. Uh, Everyone that's here joining us today, including our uh, board member, Superintendent Dr. Baker, senior team members, and the Long Beach community that is here with us today and is also watching us from home. Um, with the adoption of the board um, goals and the guardrails, our research team, um, with input from district leaders as well as curriculum leaders, um, and other staff um, from our district really developed um, metrics and thinking about how we can look at data in a different way. As we developed those metrics, we considered the type of data that is available within our district. And um, we also um, concurrently envision new, kind, new types of data that we can bring in as we start to progress monitor the goals. Um, we wanted to be able to uh, gather the stories of our community and in particular their experiences within our district. So we wanted to also consider the best practices of site leaders and staff and stakeholders as they engage with community and in sharing data. Now that you have a little bit of that context around how the progress monitoring um, uh, calendar came to be, I want you to take a look at the calendar. And what we really wanted to do is give you an overview, uh, an opportunity to be able to just look at where we're starting, which if you look at January, January um, indicates um, the adoption of the, of the calendar. And then our first dive into the data will be in February. And we really thought about uh, thinking how much data to share and when to share it. And, and thinking also about the data and when it comes in, because we want to be able to provide data as it's coming in and giving our uh, team an opportunity to analyze that data as well. So in, Jan in February, we're going to take a deeper dive and look at uh, data that supports goal one and two. And then uh, in March, we'll look at goal three and four. And one thing to note, when you look at other months such as April and May, there's going to be opportunities that we built in to listen to some of those stories that we've been talking about. And now I wanna talk a little bit more about that quantitative data and qualitative data. 
but we want to be able to define it because we don't want to assume that everyone knows what qualitative and quantitative data is. So I'm going to actually go into the quantitative data and then we'll go back to the calendar so we can talk a little more. So what is quantitative data? I want you to just think about quantitative data is that any, any kind of data that has a numerical value, anything that we can count, that we can look at, and we can quantify. When we think of quantitative data, because we also wanted to provide examples for the community of what is that quantitative data, the board goals. Board goals will generate quantitative data. We're going to be looking, as an example, at um, iReady data. We will look at grades. We'll, we will also look at um, SBAC data. So these are all examples of quantitative data that is in our system. And board goals, again, include quantitative data. Now our qualitative data, qualitative data is any type of data that really refers to um, measure, unlike quantitative data, it, the measure val val variables are more like thinking about like the phenomenons that are happening within our communities. And when you think about communities, it's not just Long Beach, it's communities that exist within the schools, um, communities that are that our schools are in. So it's really looking at those stories, those phenomena, those things that are impacting the quantitative data. So when we think about that, that monitoring calendar and those opportunities, as I mentioned, we have some months that we've identified that those are opportunities that we can probably pull in some qualitative data. And in speaking to Dr. Benitez and board member Otto, um, suggestions we're giving about, let's, let's hear some of those testimonials, those examples of things that are happening at schools that we want to highlight, those positive outliers. And we did some of that at the beginning of this year when we presented um, data. So we also have some examples of qualitative data sources because we also want to ensure that our community knows that we've been engaging in this qualitative data sources and collecting that for many years. And so we've called out a couple of, of opportunities that we've had in the past, such as our focus groups um, with um, the equitable grading um, that is going to be com coming up, transformative SEL, community forums, listening sessions, um, for example, our Wilson Young Black Scholars, the LCAP is also an opportunity to gather qualitative data, and our coalitions and committees. Um, our student advisory committees, which is Dr. Baker's RSVP group, parent connection. So we have rich qualitative data that already exists in our system. Now it's a matter of showcasing that qualitative data during those uh, months that we've identified. And then we have some additional uh, examples of qualitative data. So I'm going to go back to the monitoring. I don't know if I can, am I able to go back? <laughs> just to the progress monitoring calendar we might be competing for yeah exactly <laughs> there we go we'd get there so I wanted to take us back to the progress mon monitoring calendar because I, I, we've explained what is qualitative what is quantitative data we've also identified the um, opportunities that we will share out on goal one, two, three, and four. But if you take a note, um, a look at April, May, we will be spending some time listening to some of the stories that are coming out of our communities, our schools. Um, and then we will have our, our annual um, summative data reporting that we will participate in. So as I close, I wanna just share that progress monitoring, the purpose of progress monitoring, it's to ensure that the Board of Education and all members of the community can see the impact of our efforts in our district. Each goal will be publicly monitored at regular intervals throughout the year. And our new approach is really grounded and guided by um, our Vision 2035 and thinking in a different way, which that work was carefully crafted with community input and voice. And we want to just remind our community that we're listening and we want to share the stories that are happening in our community and also share the data 
to support all the efforts of all our departments and staff um, to support student outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any questions? Thank you, uh, Dr. Madrigal and the entire uh, team. Um, one of the things that um, at our meetings with our student outcomes focused governance uh, team that I've asked the team to sort of help, not just for our board, but for our um, community members uh, that either watch our board meetings and or um, reference uh, conversations and, and presentations um, that we have at our board meetings. I've asked um, the team as they're um, sharing, uh, whether it's qualitative or quantitative data, um, to remind us as a board uh, what the various assessments are actually measuring, uh, right? Because data in the abstract um, is important, uh, but doesn't really tell us the full uh, picture, uh, whether we're achieving and, and, and making progress toward our goals um, and or whether there are times uh, when we may need to pivot uh, and or refine uh, the, 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 the way that we are interpreting uh, the data. Um, so I think that's important for us on an ongoing basis to keep reminding ourselves what are we actually measuring with the various assessments, whether it's iReady uh, or the other tools that we're using. The second is um, some help. Um, given that we have so much data and, and some of it may or may not be disaggregated, um, for help in understanding what the data actually means, uh, right? Whether we're talking about growth, acceleration, summative data, like how are we supposed to make sense and interpret this to be able to hold ourselves accountable to the goals that we spent so much time uh, laying out. Um, additionally, um, uh, both Dr. I mean, both uh, Mr. Otto and I talked about the importance of the stories that you're sharing, uh, Dr. Madrigal, the stories behind the numbers, uh, really, and it's the different ways that students, staff, um, caregivers, family members um, interact with the assessments, but also how they understand the assessments. So when we get the notifications that students are testing uh, or doing iReady data, what, what does that mean uh, for a parent? Uh, what does that mean for a sibling uh, of a student? Are there differences on a fifth grade assessment versus an eighth grade assessment? Uh, is Mr. Zaid and his team looking at data lift differently in the third grade? And what does that third grade data mean for Dr. Camerino, uh, right, and the secondary school's uh, office? Uh, I think that's where we're going to need help, right, in connecting uh, you know, those literacy rates in the third grade have implications for uh, potentially our A through G uh, data, uh, right? So just, again, reminders of how we're thinking about uh, the data, but as importantly, how students, um, staff, uh, how a teacher uh, uses this uh, data, how our integrated teams at the schools uh, and across schools look at the data, uh, and how a parent uh, that isn't catching our school board meetings, but is getting notifications about assessments, uh, mid-year, end of year, uh, how a parent, how we can help parents to make sense of that data. Uh, and again, with the thinking that one assessment isn't the end-all, be-all of that student's um, success, uh, of that student's dreams, uh, aspirations, uh, because we also don't want these times to be times of stress for students. Uh, right, especially if we're prioritizing conversations uh, around what we're doing as a district. Um, what kinds of supports are we going to provide our teachers, uh, our school site teams, uh, and importantly, our students, so that they don't see this as a referendum of what they're not doing uh, in school, uh, but more as a what are we going to do as a collective community to ensure the success of our students. And then lastly, um, for me, it's still anchored in goals. Right. What does this mean in terms of our goals and, if necessary, uh, conversations that we may need to have as school board members uh, because one data set alone may not paint the complete picture? Um, you know, how, how do we uh, navigate what we're hearing from, let's say, a Pulse survey um, and in terms of student engagement, the correlation, right, that we were talking about last time uh, between the student sense of belonging 
and their academic uh, success. So uh, again, much appreciation for, uh, you know, sometimes we got to go slow to move fast uh, on these things, uh, to all the work that's going on behind uh, the scenes uh, with the teams, and that again, that even though we're not covering every single data point, uh, that um, we did vote on these goals, all right? So we are anchoring our priorities around this, but that doesn't mean that other things aren't happening uh, in our district and that your, your, your teams, uh, you know, are not all just uh, pivoting around four goals uh, in the district. So uh, again, just an ongoing reminder for my colleagues, for our um, community members listening and watching at home, um, that this is um, important, uh, but that it's not the end all be all uh, here of what the work that our district is doing. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're talking about students um, that clearly from all the data that we have, uh, we need to pay specific attention uh, uh, to. So uh, thank you uh, to the team. Thank you, Mr. Otto, for our conversations uh, in those uh, student outcomes focused governance uh, team meetings. So um, sort of ha help us, Mr. Moskowitz, Doctora uh, Madrigal, because uh, it's not just about presenting data, uh, right? It's about making sense of it, pivoting, changing, uh, building on. So if our superintendent's gonna come back and say, hey, we're seeing that this is working, uh, right? For us to be prepared uh, to have those uh, conversations around, well, wh what resources is this gonna take? Uh, for teachers not to worry about uh, you, know, it, you know, is this a referendum on me and what I'm doing as an individual in the classroom and to think about what supports, uh, what additional resources our school site teams uh, are going to need if we're going to realize the spirit of these goals, uh, which is to make the most impact on our students that would most benefit uh, from us looking at this data. Thank you. Ms. Lopez. Hi, just one quick question. Uh, so thank you for presenting. Um, are, so are, are teachers preparing for the, uh, for the second assessment, for the D2 uh, assessment? Are they preparing now for it? Thank you for your question. We actually just concluded our diagnostic two. Um, so at this point, we are currently, our team is analyzing the data. And so that is part of why we're going to be reporting in February. We want to ensure that we give our team enough time to be able to to look at the data and identify what are some of the, the trends that we're seeing at our different levels. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Dr. Benitez, I appreciate the reminder and, and kind, of a, kind of a good summary of uh, what, what got us to this point and, and where we're going you know, forward with everything. And I also appreciate the part where we need to hear about how our teachers are being supported, how the students are being supported. It's not just about looking at raw numbers, but the, um, the data that tells the story. And I'm especially interested in how we are supporting the people who are doing the work and also the students that we're working for. So I appreciate that reminder for us and that even though the monitoring calendar is reduced to a single page, doesn't mean that it's a, 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 as simple as that, that it represents so much more. And I look forward to um, all the information coming our way. Um, do we have any other, Mr. Yeah, Otto? Sure. Um, Dr. Benitez was saying in terms of the data we're going to be getting, what it is, what it means, and I'll try and do it kind of by an analogy, and that is um, uh, in my other career, not as a school board member, but as a lawyer, I've picked about 100 juries. And uh, in picking a jury, you have to make these decisions about who are the kind of people that you want on this particular case at this particular time because of what the charges are and because of what your defense is or what your prosecution uh, is, is going to. And oftentimes you'll hire jury consultants to do that. And they are people that have a lot of experience uh, in doing that. Uh, they're people that uh, 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 read books and know lots about social scientific data. But um, 
This is kind of what we're doing here now too. There's qualitative, there's quantitative data. You know, there are tests that people take and we can look at those and we can draw conclusions from that. But there is also a qualitative information, qual qualitative data that we get as well. Just like when you pick juries, you look at people and you say, I don't want that juror or I want that juror. For, for reasons that you know based on your experience. So I want to talk a little bit about qualitative data and what it is that we do here at uh, the Long Beach Unified School District to do that. We have adopted a program or programs here that say it's not only important to test our students, but it's also important to know our students, to make sure that they are heard, that they have voice, and that when they're, what that means is that you get to know them better, that they are seen, which means that they are ad, uh, identified, that they are acknowledged, and that gives us information too, which isn't reducible to uh, quantitative uh, data, uh, but it comes from uh, deep-rooted motivations, emotions, behaviors, decisions that people make, uh, and trying to weave that into something. I, uh, because of the uh, African-American um, emphasis that we've done in the last couple of years here now, I can see the differences in these programs as, you, as they are reflected on the faces of Af African-American students that I see uh, at Wilson High School where I spend more time at Jordan High School when we do specific events. And if somebody tried to say to me, that's not information. It's not quantitative. We don't know what to do with that. I would say, you know, I've been picking juries for a long time and uh, I've been um, making decisions and sometimes I make better decisions than other ones, but, but what we're trying to do here with this information, with the social emotional learning which we are emphasizing, with the wellness centers that we have is to present, <coughs> excuse me, um, information that is not data as we ordinarily understand it as measurements on tests and how people do. Somebody might have a bad day taking a test. Somebody may have a particularly good day. Somebody may have a disposition to do well or somebody else who's just as smart and just as uh, uh, talented and as, uh, intelligent uh, uh, does well or doesn't do well. And so the qualitative data is very important. And it's the ability to see it. It's the ability to then make, make decisions and judgments about people that we need to focus on as well. And I say that because um, there's lots of ways to get quantitative data. We do it. We test people, we give them all these tests. Uh, the revelation to me early on when I was on this board was we went from the testing that we did to this iReady testing, which meant that we knew in three months or less, uh, almost six weeks, um, uh, how kids did on tests, but that doesn't give us everything that we uh, need to know and that we wanna know in order to make kids move forward. So um, I'm trying to emphasize that what we're doing in setting up this monitoring calendar is saying, okay, what we're gonna do is look at who our students are, are they being seen, are they being heard, uh, how, do we, how do we know those things? And we know what the tests say, but the qualitative data that we're also looking at will also give us information about how to help these students succeed. And, uh, uh, I, I've been involved in studies when I was in college and, and afterwards where uh, we used uh, different measures to see who, which exhibits were most popular at the S Chicago Museum of Science and Industry and what we finally decided on was, well, it was the Hatching Chicks exhibit because we had to replace the tiles in front of those exhibits more often than we did in other exhibits and that must be that more people went there and that was popular. That was good information but it didn't tell you who was going to become somebody that went into that field or became so interested in uh, the growth of animals and whatnot that they went into that field as well. So what, what I'm trying to say is that um, we're looking at the not only the, the data, uh, the, the test scores, but the quali quality and, and richness of the things that go on 
And we have to keep our eyes open to that. And I think that this monitoring calendar helps us do that. It says, hey, uh, what do we got? And um, it's laid out for the course of one year. Now, what they tell us, uh, what our consultant tells us, and what the student uh, outcomes uh, uh, form of government governance that we are we have adopted says is that you um, uh, you need to to know how they're doing, and that doesn't mean just by tests. It means by looking at it in a holistic way. And that's what this calendar has decided. We, 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 we're, we were told, do a five-year calendar. Well, we are. But we're doing it one year now. It may be different next year. Uh, but it's always focused on what, we, what the students are doing to succeed. And uh, I'm very uh, excited about what we're doing. Uh, it's off the ground. Uh, we're going to hear in a very short period of time what the initial data is. But it's not everything, and yet we're trying to get an accurate picture of what it takes not to measure people, but to understand what that measurement means. That's all. Thank One you. One quick last question um, is that um, are the diagnostic tests um, aligned with the pacing guides? As we look at the, the diagnostic test is aligned for the most part. Um, this year, it's slightly off, but it's uh, for the most part aligned. And when I say off, the align, I would say like two weeks. So what we're looking at right now, when we look at the data for next month, we're going to be looking at diagnostic two primarily because diagnostic one, we have to take into consideration that some of our students perhaps participated in some type of summer enrichment or program and while others did not. So there might be some loss of, of learning during that summer. So that first diagnostic test is really to get a baseline data to see where are students and we can definitely compare it to where they were in Diagnostic 3. Uh, but this Diagnostic 2 is going to really give us a good um, understanding or insight on where our students are based on the number of instructional uh, weeks that they've had, as well as looking at, for example, what's been taught, looking at the math, the ELA um, pacing guides. So we're going to look at all of that, and that is part of the reason why we need this time before we report out. Um, so, yes, it is for the most part aligned, but we have to take into consideration multiple factors. Thank you. Okay, so this is an action item, and I'm going to need a motion. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Then I'm going to ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 4 0. Thank you. And thank you to our staff for that. I know that was um, <clears throat> a lot of effort to put that together, so thank you. Um, next, we have item 17.2 approval of recommended appointment of personnel commissioner. And I'm going to turn things over to our legal counsel to help us out. Thank you, President Craighead. Uh, due to the fact that our uh, personnel commission was created prior to September of 1965, the statute requires that this Board of Education uh, make a recommendation to the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, uh, who will then make the appointment for the commission. Uh, so tonight what we're asking you for is to vote on that recommendation to the State uh, superintendent of Public Instruction. The process that we went through followed the law. We recruited through social media and the internet. Uh, we had a diverse uh, six-member interview panel. Uh, the panel scored all, all four of the uh, uh, candidates who applied. Uh, and Drew Schneider, Mr. Drew Schneider, uh, was recommended by the panel based on final scores that were tallied up. Uh, we note uh, that interested parties under the statute, CSEA, uh, requests or makes, rec makes a recommendation of Terrence Ulazewski. Sorry, I do that every time. 
and, and as a strumfer, I should know better, right? And I get I get messed up all the time too. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the other interested party album uh, makes recommendation of Mr. Schneider. Uh, upon approval by the of the recommendation by this board, a letter will be sent to the state superintendent of public instruction with that recommendation. Okay, and it's my understanding that the board makes the recommendation to our state superintendent and then that decision is up to the state superintendent. Mr. Thurman will make the final uh, uh, appointment, yes. Okay. And uh, since this is an action item, I'm going to need a motion. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Uh, I'll ask our, or no, you have discussion? Yeah. I, so I, th this was a hard decision, and it was a hard decision because it's an important job and the recommendation is a change. This is not just, this is what we think, we're making a recommendation to the superintendent. Um, if you look at the two candidates, um, they are almost identical in terms of what the evaluation is. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Snyder had 500, uh, 557 votes, I think, and uh, Mr. Yulishevsky had uh, 567, uh, I got it wrong. But, uh, that, that, that's all right, but I will correct you if you'd like me to. Well, uh, it's, there's four points. Four difference. point difference. Yeah, yes. there's a four, four point difference, and, uh, and that's not much. Uh, Mr. Yulishevsky's been on the board for 23 years, I believe, or 27 years, and uh, uh, has given us long service. He's a retired uh, Navy captain with a lot of experience in personnel matters, and uh, that's a lot of experience. And uh, we've uh, gone over Mr. Schneider's uh, information and, uh, and application, and he's a, he's a very qualified person, so how do you make a decision? Well, the way that I make my decision in this matter is that I think that after a careful review of the Personnel Commission and the issues before them, that there needs to be some change. And what I mean by that is that um, uh, there's a lot of issues that are out there uh, that need to be addressed, and um, it's gone on for a long, long time, basically in the ways that it is, and I think that um, uh, it's, it, we, we would be well served by making the change at this point to uh, shine a little more light on the personnel commission and what the, what it is that they do. So, just wanted to say that. Um, any further discussion? Then I'll ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Member Lopez. Aye. Member Otto. Aye. President Craighead. Aye. Member Benitez. Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote. Aye. That passes 4-0. Thank you. Um, now we are, we are at report of board members, so we will start with our student board member, Axel. Uh, Happy New Year's. I am hoping everyone had a wonderful winter break. Uh, I would just like to mention that our finals week is coming up for our students, and I know this is a stressful time for all of our students, and I am sending well wishes to every student during their finals. Also, students across the district in the superintendent's advisory uh, committee, RSVP, had their first in-person meeting and discussed areas of growth for our district and uh, are actively working together to help make recommendations to solve some of these issues that students face. Our site nights are coming up. I would like to give a huge shout out to Lakewood, Browning, and McBride, and Renaissance, who's actually having their site night today. So that's very fun for representing their schools uh, to their prospective students. Jordan High School will be having their annual site night tomorrow at 6 to 8 p.m. And we will be having our display of our pathways, such as our engineering pathway, ACE, our healthcare pathway, AIMS, our JMAC pathway, which is media and communications, our law enforcement and public service, which is LEAPS, and much more. If you would like to know more about the site nights across the high schools, please visit lbschools.net slash choice and click the high school choice button. 
Uh, I would also like to shout out our Healthcare Pathway students across multiple high schools like Jordan, Polly, and Lakewood, and McBride for beginning their certified nursing assistant training, and I wish them the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Thank you. Just one item for me, President Craighead, and it's um, actually related to one of the items in our consent calendar uh, tonight. Uh, Board Member Lopez and I were able to attend last week's uh, Special Education Community Advisory Committee uh, meeting. And um, those meetings, um, uh, ever since I joined the board, and, and even before I joined uh, the board, I, I got a chance to attend, um, are always powerful spaces for me um, to not just um, hear about the ongoing challenges that students with disabilities or families or caregivers continue to face in our district, um, but that much of the, many of the conversations of the frustrations um, and of the positive things um, have led to our board taking action. Um, so uh, I know that all of our uh, board members have attended in, at one point or another. Um, at this last uh, CAC meeting, um, one of the things that was emphasized was the impact that adult behaviors have on student outcomes. And that happens to be one of the anchors of our student outcomes focused governance work. Uh, and in essence, that student outcomes don't change until adult behaviors change. Um, it, it saddens me that we have parents in our district, families in our district, students in our district that um, have heard that they can choose another district if things are not going the way that they'd like it to go. Uh, I'm glad that we have Dr. Simon uh, there reiterating to folks, we want you here and acknowledging that we can do better, uh, particularly in the areas like reclassifying emerging bilinguals in ways that are more inclusive and equitable for our students with disabilities. Rethinking the way that we approach IEPs. And so I wanna thank the, uh, the parents, the students, the community members that spend time and energy and all the effort that it takes to develop recommendations that then come to our board and that then lead to substantive, concrete progress. Uh, we don't get it perfect all the time, uh, but it's important, I think, for our communities, our disability communities, our, our, our disability champions, um, to see uh, the progress that we're making. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Dr. Simon uh, hearing the recommendations coming out of this year, uh, but also getting updates on the progress and the um, remaining opportunities that we have to make progress. Um, so again, just props to uh, the time, the effort, that's involved, we, we are listening, we are watching, we are getting data, uh, we're getting updates on progress, um, and um, your efforts are uh, always seen and appreciated. Um, and to our LBUSD team members, I'm gonna pull it out there one more time, Dr. Simon, if you wanna respond, feel free to do so. Um, I, I think we can still host some kind of office hours, consultation hours, because we always run out of time at the end of these meetings, and we have all hands on deck, right? So many LBUSD staff are there, uh, just kind of asking our team to rethink while presentations are going on, while questions are being asked, that we could have uh, a group of our staff there. Um, and, you know, on, and, and we do, it's just hard, because sometimes when, um, when families and caregivers want to talk specifics about their students, we remind them, uh, right, that, that's probably not the best time to talk specifics, but that our team is available to them. So just gonna ask our team again to, to consider hosting, even if it's 10 minute quick consultations individually, because then I see the flood right after the meetings of our uh, parents and caregivers approaching. So uh, thank you, Dr. Simon, for, for uh, being proactive in those spaces. Uh, thank you uh, to the CAC members, especially the leadership. Uh, it takes a lot of courage uh, to be vulnerable uh, in those situations, but that that courage results to uh, in recommendations that then our board takes action on and then our teams uh, execute and operationalize. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Mr. Otto? 
And I wish everybody a happy new year, and I think we're off to a good start. I think that we did a lot of work tonight, this for the last several weeks before uh, uh, this meeting, and we, we, we have laid forth an agenda of things to come that I'm excited about. And uh, I look forward to uh, meetings uh, coming up where we can continue with this monitoring calendar of this new student outcomes uh, form of governance that we've adopted. Looking forward to progress that uh, is uh, is about to come on a, a number of different areas, and that's that's what I say. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Thank you. I attended the uh, State of the City address at the, the uh, Terrace Theater. And I really enjoyed seeing some of our incredibly talented LBUSD high school students um, perform. And I also want to extend um, a congratulations uh, to Dr. Bake, uh, Dr. Brown, sorry. Congrats on your appointment uh, to the Police Oversight Committee. Um, I was also able to attend the um, Community Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, and the information provided to parents on the amendments made uh, to SB 445 will help non-English speaking parents in our district better understand uh, the IEP process and services their child is receiving. Um, and thank you, Donna, if you're out there for inviting me to the meeting. And uh, the MLK parade uh, last Saturday was so wonderful. LBUS kids, parents, and community members were in attendance. And kudos to all the schools who have participated, including Jordan, Polly, Wilson, Cabrillo, and Powell. And finally, our eight, fifth and eighth grade students are getting ready to apply to either middle school or high school soon. And it is my hope that the uh, school of choice process will really give families uh, a choice. Um, I wanna quickly share a story with you all. Um, over the weekend, I was having breakfast at George's 50s Diner on Atlantic Boulevard, and I began a conversation with the woman who was waiting my table. And that woman is an LBUSD parent. Um, <clears throat> two of her kids have graduated from our district, and two are still enrolled. Um, her oldest, um, her oldest the, the three oldest have had a choice of attending a school outside of their area. And that really paved the way for higher education in their family. Uh, the oldest uh, daughter graduated from UC Irvine, and um, the second one is a senior at Stanford University, and the third is a senior at CAMS and is expected to attend an Ivy in the fall, an Ivy college. Um, she's also hopeful that her eighth grader, who will be, um, will be able to attend CAMS, next school year and believes that if her children had not been given that opportunity to uh, enroll in a school outside of uh, their area, they would not have been as, as successful. Um, it is stories like, th like these um, that continue to remind us of the importance of school of choice and the impact it has on our families. Um, let's continue opening doors for our kids and um, let's give them a real choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Um, yes, because Mr. Miller's not here, I want to make sure we acknowledge the MLK parade. I know that for, um, for Mr. Miller and his family, that's a very important event. And <clears throat> I, um, I chose to participate with a group called One Long Beach. I usually uh, ride in the truck and it was um, important for me to join this group because I've been serving on the um, uh, violence intervention and prevention committee and um, it, it just felt like the right thing to do and, and the right time and um, let's see another another thing I wanted to mention and this is just a, a kind of a unique idea but the Millican band had a fundraiser over the weekend that was a mattress sale <laughs> and um, I just thought that was a really unique uh, fundraiser, and so it was in the in in the small gym, and it was set up like uh, a mattress store where you had you know here are the firmer mattresses on this side and the softer mattresses. Anyhow, I hope it was successful. There were plenty of people there, so I think they sold some mattresses. Um, 
So if you're looking for a fundraiser idea, there you go. Um, <clears throat> and also, today marks the 30th anniversary of the Northridge earthquake. I can't believe it's been 30 years, but I thought maybe we could take this opportunity to um, stop and think about how we're doing at home, especially with uh, being prepared. Being, I mean, we live in California, so we have to be prepared for these events. And I know um, for myself, I'm gonna go around my house and check, you know, are my, uh, do I have large furniture that maybe could fall over? Do I have um, a supply of food, maybe canned food that, you know, can hold, hold hold my husband and I over if stores are closed, um, that type of thing. I know that um, I have a, a little to-go bag. It's a backpack, and I have, um, I have things like a can opener in case a lot of those canned food items survive. And um, also some cash in small... I don't have a lot of money tucked away, so don't get any <laughs> ideas, but, um, you know, right, yeah, I know. I know, and I just said that. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> regret that one later, but um, a small amount, you know, small bills because I'm thinking, uh, you know, ATMs won't be working, that kind of, stores might, you know, only accept, ca I don't know, but um, maybe now I'm realizing that to-go bag is from a long time ago and I need to update that. Anyhow, 30th anniversary, Northridge earthquake, maybe we, um, you know, take stock in what we do. I know for um, our classrooms, they do drills. I'm, I, I know we've been doing that for a long time. Not fire, stop, drop, and roll. Earthquake is uh, um, drop and cover and hold on. I think there were two, th three of them. Um, yeah. Anyhow, so I'm going to now pass it on to you, Dr. Baker, for your report. All right, thank you. So um, I have saved my voice for the end of the meeting, and this is an opportunity I'm gonna, going to use my superintendent's report tonight to appreciate the Board of Education. So in front of you, you have a framed proclamation that is connecting us to the California School Board Association Declaration of January as School Board Recognition Month. So I'm going to read the proclamation, and then we want to just express our appreciation for all that you do for us. Whereas an excellent public education system is vital to the quality of life for all California citizens and communities. And whereas Board of Education members continue to advocate to best serve the children in our community each and every day. And whereas local Board of Education members are committed to children and believe that all children can be successful learners and that the best education is tailored to the individual needs of the child. And whereas Board of Education members work closely with parents, educational professionals, and other community members to create the healthiest environments possible where all students can thrive. And whereas Board of Education members are strong advocates for public education and are responsible for communicating the needs of the school district to the public and the public's expectations to the district. And whereas the mission of the public schools to meet the diverse educational needs of all children and to empower them to become competent, productive contributors to a democratic society and an ever-changing world is more poignant than ever before. Now, therefore, I, Superintendent, do hereby declare my appreciation on behalf of the entire school district to Board President Diana Craighead, Board Vice President Doug Otto, Board Member Maria Isabel Lopez, Board Member Eric Miller, Board Member Juan Benitez, and Student Board Member Axel Aguilar, and proclaim the month of January 2024 as School Board Recognition Month in the Long Beach Unified School District. I urge all community members to join me in recognizing the dedication and hard work of our local school board members and in working with them to create an education system that meets the needs of our children. And so we will stand and recognize you today.
We greatly appreciate you and the service that you provide, not just in this room, but each and every day on behalf of students. And Axel, that you bring this, your student's voice to the, to the dais as well. We are so grateful for all that you do. And so you have a token of appreciation in a little gift and your proclamation to put in a place that reminds you of how much we appreciate you for the work that you do and the leadership you provide in Long Beach Unified School District. Thank you. Thank you for that recognition. Um, it feels a little odd to, <laughs> you know, to be um, recognized like that. Um, but, Thank you, Ms. Craighead. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Thank you for representing us, Axel. Thank you, school board. Well, I don't know how much we paid those kids, but it was well worth it. Um, thank you again, everybody. Um, we certainly don't do this work on our own, that's for sure. Um, so that, that concludes the uh, business of the meeting. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for your support. And our next regularly scheduled meeting is Wednesday, Janu uh, February 7th. This is already January. February 7th. So um, good night, everyone, and thank you for being here. <laughs>